the first time that Mussolini met Hitler, he gave him a leather-bound set of Nietzsche's writings. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. And it's really significant to my way of thinking because I think, as you say, he loathed Christianity, but he was very aware that its collapse might have much deeper consequences yeah. than the other, if I can use this word, trendy atheists of the day realised. I yeah. wonder whether we're still not grappling with what's no, really we're left. We're not, we're not at all. Uh, and the reason for that is precisely the way in which Nietzsche's philosophy fed into, into fascism. Mm. Um, uh, so Nietzsche, Nietzsche was particularly contemptuous of, um, uh, of English liberals. Uh, he saw it as a peculiarly kind of English disease, so I'm sure he would, would have included Australians under that umbrella. Um, and and he, was, he was contemptuous of the idea that he associated with, with kind of people like George Eliot, that um, you could get rid of Christian belief, but still have the kind of superstructure of, um, uh, you know, Christian ideals and Christian philosophy and Christian teachings and Christian assumptions. Um, and I think that he would, you know, if he were alive today, he would be as contemptuous of Richard Dawkins or A.C. Grayling, um, as he was of George Eliot. And he would say of, of both of them and of most atheists in the West today that they are basically Christians. Uh, you know, Nietzsche saw humanists, communists, liberals, people who may have defined themselves against Christianity as being absolutely in the fundamentals Christian. And I think he's, you know, I think he's right about that because I think that um, in a sense, so much of, of you, you know, there's a sense in which Atheism that doesn't repudiate the kind of the ethics and the morals and the values of Christianity is really simply a logical endpoint of a trend within Protestantism. It's, and indeed Christianity generally. Because, you know, going right the way back to the Hebrew prophets, you know, who precede Christianity, what they are preaching is a kind of desacralization of the world. They look at springs and trees and mountaintops and they say there are no gods there there are no spirits there uh you know this is just stock and stone god is up there uh, and this is something that obviously christians inherit so that when you know christian missionaries go out into the dripping woods of saxony they chop down the you know the great trees that are sacred to the norse gods the nordic gods the germanic gods and say look these are just trees yeah. and they chop them up and turn them into chapels um and in a sense, what then happens in the Reformation, when you get Protestant reformers looking at the Catholic Church and saying, well, this is all just hocus pocus, this is mumbo jumbo, this is ludicrous magic. Uh, we must, um, you know, we must, we must get rid of this kind of magical thinking. We must restore the church to its kind of natural purity. That sense that um, superstition must be banished, that idols must be overthrown, is something that, of course, in the long run, will be picked up by, by, uh, by atheist radicals. But, you know, whether it's in the, in, in the French Revolution or whether it's in kind of new atheist movement in the 21st century, they're still basically cleaving to the kind of the fundamental Christian ideas. It's just, and, and, and the very idea that you should, you know, banish superstition, get rid of, uh, of idols, that doing that will bring you into enlightenment, that the people who walk in darkness will, be, will, will see a great light. I mean, this is a kind of Christian idea through and through. And as I say, I think it's, I think the, the idea that having banished, you know, the supernatural from springs and trees, you end up banishing the supernatural from everything is a kind of logical endpoint. And imagining that banishing them will somehow bring you to, to truth. 